All right, thank you everyone for tuning in today. So I'm going to be discussing nuclear power and the potential that it might have to assist us with the mitigation of climate change. So before we get started, I just wanted to give a bit of a background on where we are currently at. So as I'm sure most of you probably know, greenhouse gas emissions are a major contributor to global warming and climate change. And these gases are released in mass by conventional fuel and energy production methods such as uh, burning fossil fuels and also natural gas. In 2016, a total of 196 parties signed the Paris Agreement, the main goal of which is to limit increase in global average temperature to no more than 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, with an idealised situation of no more than 1.5 degrees of global warming. Now, in order to reach and stay on track for these targets, studies have shown that net zero emissions need to be achieved by 2050. Now, since carbon dioxide contributes to about 75% of total greenhouse gas emissions, it is therefore crucial that countries move away from these conventional high carbon emitting energy sources and instead look into CO2 neutral, low carbon emitting and renewable sources of energy. So if we hope to lower our CO2 emissions and stay on track for the Paris Agreement, a future containing a number of different energy sources might be our best option, rather than just one single best answer. And this is where I believe nuclear power may have a significant role to play. So nuclear power is not totally emission-free. However, the direct emissions are essentially zero, and the indirect emissions are comparable to those of renewable energy sources. So, does nuclear energy have the potential to assist in the mitigation of climate change? Well, let's get into it. So let's first have a bit of a rundown on how nuclear energy works. So we have two different types of nuclear energy. We have nuclear fission, which has been used here on Earth to produce energy since about the mid 20th century. And we have nuclear fusion, shown on the right-hand side here. So nuclear fission involves we start with a very heavy nuclei. So uh, for example, uranium is quite commonly the fuel used for nuclear fission here on Earth. And we bombard this heavy nuclei with a neutron. And what this does is it causes the uranium nuclei to become unstable and thus it splits and forms these two slightly lighter nuclei and releases enormous amounts of energy in this process along with a free neutron as shown here. Now, these three neutrons then go on to initiate further fission reactions in what is known as a chain reaction. So this essentially makes nuclear fission a self-sustaining process. Now, fusion, on the other hand, shown on the right here, with nuclear fusion, we start on the other end of the spectrum. So we begin with very light nuclei as opposed to very heavy. Conventionally, fusion reactors here on Earth use hydrogen isotopes, such as deuterium and tritium, which are shown here. And by forcing these two light nuclei together, we also release enormous amounts of energy. Um, now, nuclear fusion, we haven't really quite cracked the code on it yet. There are still a number of methods that uh, are being researched, but a number of roadblocks that are presenting themselves. And this is unfortunate because nuclear fusion produces a lot more energy than nuclear fission and also arguably has a number of benefits, which we'll get into a bit more later. But for now, let's, let's focus on nuclear fission. There are currently about 440 operational nuclear power reactors across the globe. And these are providing us with about 10% of our global energy uh, or electricity production. Now, many nations have plans to increase their nuclear fission capacity, while many on the other side of things are starting to decrease their fission capacity. So for example, China is by far leading the charge. By 2030, they have plans to significantly increase their nuclear fission capacity. Whereas in some Western countries, we're seeing the opposite happen. So, you know, in some European countries, we're starting to see countries shutting down their nuclear power stations as opposed to opening up new ones. And why this is, we'll get into this a little bit later as well. For now, let's look at how good nuclear fission really is as a low carbon energy source. 
So it only takes 500 grams of uranium oxide to generate the same amount of electricity as 7.3 tons of coal, uranium oxide being the refined form of uranium ore before it's enriched. So on top of this pretty amazing uh, fuel efficiency, the direct emissions from nuclear fission are essentially zero. Now, as I mentioned before, we should also consider the indirect emissions that are arising from the nuclear life cycle. So this would include, uh, for example, construction of the nuclear power plant, transport of materials, and then also when we consider the fuel, uranium, this needs to be mined, milled, uh, enriched, fabricated. There are a number of steps involved with getting the material from the earth into a state that's actually usable in a nuclear fission reactor. So estimates of the average life cycle carbon dioxide emissions of nuclear power, nuclear fission specifically, do vary quite a bit from source to source. In this figure here, you'll see nuclear way down on the right-hand side with an estimated uh, 12 grams of carbon dioxide produced per kilowatt hour. So this ranks it very well on the grand scheme of things. This comes from the nuclear, the World Nuclear Association based on data from the International Panel on Climate Change's 2005 report. So when we look at more recent studies, this number seems to vary quite a bit and it has more of a large range as opposed to just a single number. So in a 2020 study, this uh, estimate of average life cycle carbon dioxide emissions was put somewhere between 1.4 grams and 288 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. Now, even at this, the maximum of this range, 288 grams, this still puts nuclear well below coal, uh, significantly less than natural gas as well, showing that on the grand scheme of things, it really does present itself quite well as a, a low carbon uh, energy source. So looking at some of the other benefits of nuclear fission, uh, there's actually significantly less material and land use required for nuclear fission than there is even for some renewable energies, as you can see in the graph here. So this, of course, has a lot of benefits for the environment as well. In terms of land use, less land use means uh, less land clearance. So this means less chance of biodiversity loss and also less removal of these natural carbon sinks, such as forests that are already here and helping the earth uh, when it comes to mitigation of climate change by soaking up all that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, in terms of material use, less material use is also very beneficial for the earth and also for the slowing of global warming. As some of you may know, the cement or the concrete industry is a major producer of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. So if we're able to cut down on the amount of materials such as these harmful ones that are being used, this is also very beneficial. One thing to note here is that uh, nuclear fission reactors do use large amounts of water. And this is not something that's given here in this material requirements chart, but one downside of nuclear fission is the large amount of water required to run these plants. So let's now move on to some of the challenges and valid concerns that people have with nuclear fission. Now, public perception of nuclear energy has long been divided. Many argue for the use of nuclear fission, many argue against it, and both really do have valid cases. So let's look at some of the potential issues and problems that have arose in the past. Maybe the most prominent concern to do with nuclear fission is that of nuclear accidents. So for example, we have the Fukushima disaster in Japan, we have the Chernobyl disaster in Ukraine, and both of these are, of course, disasters that we want to avoid happening again, um, you know, at, at any cost, really. Now, another major concern is the production and storage of nuclear waste. And there's a number of different types of waste produced from nuclear fission, but some are definitely more harmful than others. So for example, the high level waste, which is radioactive and contains heavy elements, fission products such as plutonium-239. Now plutonium-239 has a half-life of 24,000 years approximately. So this of course is quite problematic. And our current method of dealing with this is to 
store this high level waste in large steel and concrete containers and bury them in geological repositories um, such that they are isolated from the environment and not leaking out and causing any damage. Other concerns to do with nuclear fission involve the high building cost and operation cost of nuclear fission plants, the large amount of water that is required to run these plants, which I mentioned previously. And this is why quite often nuclear fission plants are built on coastlines, so they have access to uh, a large amount of water. And then we also have the problem of a finite fuel supply here on Earth. So nuclear fission plants operate on these heavy elements, as I mentioned earlier, such as uranium. And yeah, we only have a finite supply of uranium here on Earth. So what happens when we run out of uranium? So on that side of things, fission is obviously not uh, an ultimate long-term strategy. Now, this is perhaps where nuclear fusion comes in to take over. So nuclear fusion is the power or the process that powers the sun. Uh, and other stars in the universe as well, actually. So within these hot balls of gas, we have these small nuclei uh, fusing together and progressively getting heavier and heavier and reducing enormous amounts of energy in the process. So this is essentially what scientists are attempting to do here on Earth, is to make an artificial sun, if you will, uh, and emulate the process that's happening inside of stars in order to create reliable and clean energy. And nuclear fusion is often referred to as the holy grail of energy. You might have seen this in online articles or in the news. And there's probably a good reason uh, as to why it has been uh, dubbed this, which I'm sure you might be able to tell after this presentation. So there's many benefits of fusion as compared to fission. Uh, number one, fusion does not have any waste. There is waste, but the, the waste isn't harmful. So the waste produced from nuclear fusion is helium, which is a non-toxic gas. It has many practical applications here on Earth. And yeah, it's not something that needs to be buried in a repository for thousands of years. It's safe to handle. Um, so this really eliminates the problem of waste that arises from nuclear fission. Secondly, uh, there's no risk of meltdown or you know, the nuclear accidents that we've seen happen with nuclear fission. And this because there is no chain reaction process occurring for nuclear fusion. So this means that if something goes wrong, the reactor can essentially be switched off and we don't have to worry about these ongoing chain reactions that, that happen within uh, fission reactors, which has caused these nuclear meltdowns to happen in the past. Another benefit from fusion is the type of fuel used in the reactors. So here we're eliminating the problem of having a very finite fuel supply like we do with uranium, because in nuclear fusion reactors, we're using hydrogen. And hydrogen happens to be the most abundant element in the universe, which means uh, it's very good for us. It kind of solves this problem of having a finite fuel supply. Um, and it's a lot easier to source as well than uranium, which requires a lot of deep mining and that long process that I required earlier in terms of getting the uranium to a state where it can actually be used within a reactor. So similar to fission, fusion production uh, involves no direct emissions, which is great. Uh, the only indirect emissions that would arise from it are, of course, construction of the plant and those kind of processes. So as you can probably see, uh, it sounds pretty great, right? Um, nuclear fission seems to be good, but nuclear fusion comes in and solves all of these problems that nuclear fission has. It, it seems to do everything better. So why are we not using nuclear fusion yet? Um, you know, if it's this holy grail of energy, why have we not got fusion reactors running in every country? Well, unfortunately, nuclear fusion cannot quite solve our climate woes. Uh, there are a number of roadblocks stopping us from being able to probably utilize it as a viable energy source. And the main problem we're having here is the problem of energy in versus energy out. So what this means is that scientists are spending more energy to initiate and sustain the fusion process than they're receiving uh, as energy out from the fusion process. Now, of course, for an energy source to be viable, we want to be getting more energy out than we're putting in. So in December of last year, for the first time ever, 
scientists at the National Ignition Facility in California actually achieved net positive energy gain from a fusion reaction. So this means that they got more energy out than they put in. And this was actually repeated again in July of this year, 2023. Now, although this was an amazing breakthrough and really a, a great, a huge step in the right direction, it really isn't maybe the grand achievement that it was made out to be because uh, on top of producing enough energy to sustain the fusion reaction, uh, we also need to be able to produce enough energy to power the station in which the reactor resides and also to facilitate the process of converting the heat from the nuclear fusion process into electrical energy, which can then be used in the grid by us. So unfortunately, there's still a long way to go before this will happen, but this is a great step in the right direction, definitely. So exciting projects such as ITER are currently in the works, and this is a collaboration between about 35 nations, which is expected to start in 2025. And if successful, this could really pave the way for future reactor designs uh, all across the world. So IDA are expecting to have a uh, significant net energy gain from their fusion reactors, which is why this could be such a monumental project. On top of IDA, we also have a number of startups all across the world that are developing new confinement techniques, uh, better reactor technologies, experimenting with different types of fuel. There's really just a lot of exciting work happening in this field, which is amazing to see. Uh, on top of this, we also have developments in other fields that are actually finding their way into nuclear fusion research and finding applications there. So one example of this is kind of on the material science side of things. In 2021 at MIT, scientists developed this huge, powerful superconducting magnet. And this magnet was actually found to have some very important applications in nuclear fusion. Namely, that is that this magnet allows nuclear fusion reactors to produce these enormous powerful magnetic fields that they require to initiate the fusion process using far, far less energy than was previously thought possible. So this will also be greatly beneficial to the struggle of energy in versus energy out. So this massive uh, superconducting magnet is going to be used for the first time in what is known as the spark reactor, which is also currently one that is uh, in development. So the debate over the utilization of nuclear energy as a mitigation strategy for climate change is still ongoing and will still be for quite some time. But I hope that today I've at least provided some valuable insights into both sides of the argument as to why or why it may not be used as a potential mitigation strategy. So looking at the positives, nuclear energy can assist us with providing a low carbon, high capacity alternative that reduces greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector. On the other hand, uh, concerns about safety, nuclear waste, high costs, and negative opinions that result from this uh, from the public will, of course, continue to cast a shadow over the current state and future of nuclear fusion and nuclear energy as a whole. Now, although nuclear fusion should probably be our ultimate goal in terms of clean, reliable energy, alongside existing renewables that we already are utilizing. It seems it will be quite some time before this can actually be a reality. So that's where maybe nuclear fission has a role to play. Um, instead of sticking with our conventional fossil fuels and natural gas, nuclear fusion could immediately provide a low carbon energy solution uh, to replace these and work alongside renewable energies in providing us clean, low carbon energy while we continue to develop our nuclear fusion technologies to a point in which it's actually viable. So yeah, I mean, on both sides of the table, continued research into both fission and fusion is going to continue to improve both these technologies. And of course, bring us closer to a future uh, that is more sustainable and one in which all life can thrive. Thank you.